Now we will have the president of the Howard University Chapel Assistants, Ms. Chantel Williams, to bring us this morning's greetings. Good morning, Chapel family. My name is Chantel Williams, and I serve as the president of the Chapel Assistants. We had a great and informative voting rights and DC statehoods discussion meeting last Friday, led by Santish Kane and Olivia Carroll in collaboration with the HU and AACP and students for DC statehood. This Friday, please join us for our field trip to the National Portrait Gallery. More information will be provided in the group meet. Food will be provided. If you'd like to learn more about chapel assistance and the events we host, please follow us on Instagram and Twitter at CA underscore underscore Howard U and join the group me. Will all the chapel assistants please stand? We will be in the back of the tent after service. Feel free to ask us any questions about chapel assistance. Join the office of the Dean of the Chapel for Wells and this Wednesdays on the yard a weekly 30-minute wellness booster beginning at 12.15 p.m. Meet Dean, Richard, Dean Richardson sorry, under the tent on the main yard for a retreat on self-compassion, being kinder to ourselves. The Student Leadership Commission is on Sunday, October 3rd at 11 a.m. Student, Le student Leadership Commissioning is a time for the entire Howard University community to welcome new student leaders into the great legacy of leadership here at HU. This year, our theme is reimagining community, and we are excited to have President Wayne Frederick as our speaker. Please stay after service for a chat and chew with Reverend Dr. Otis Moss right here under the tent. Lastly, today we have a call to chapel from the men of George Washington Carver Incorporated. Thank you and have a great week. Okay, I'm sorry. Good morning. My name is Langston Locke. I am a sophomore chemical engineering major, chemistry minor from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. My name is Evan Quaintance. I am a political science second year junior from Jacksonville, Florida, and I serve as the co-program chair for the men of George Washington Carver. And on, and on the behalf of the men of George Washington Carver Incorporated, we would like to invite the Howard community to our fall week of events titled Hair to the Throne which kicks off tomorrow with a discussion on various topics affecting Generation Z. Throughout the week, we will be also be taking donations. You will find out how to donate on our social media pages at MOGWCINC on Instagram and at MOGWC on Twitter. Thank you and have a blessed, blessed Sunday. Olivia, please stand. She's busy changing the cloths for these mics. And on Friday, she did an excellent presentation on voting rights. And I just give God thanks for her. I'm excited for many reasons uh, today, but uh, my advisor, my, my rock is here visiting from back home from California, Mrs. Anita Moore Hackney, who was president of the Religious Fellowship Council, hear this, in 1947. Can you stand to? When I was candidating for this position, she was on that committee 
and uh, she took me under her wings, and I've been there ever since. And I just thank God for you and all that you've done for me and for the chapel. God bless you. Also, like to acknowledge uh, this morning, uh, Dean Felicia Rashad. Where, is, is she, where, where are you? Please stand that we can acknowledge you. Thank you. And Dean Rashad has been at every chapel event during the week since the beginning of the school year. And I want to thank you for your support. God bless you. I'm going to ask friends of the chapel to please stand that we can just acknowledge you also. All any friends of the chapel who are here this morning. My, my. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you so much. I'd like to acknowledge one other family. Uh, Dr. Kanika Jones is here with her entire family. I'm going to ask if they stand so we can acknowledge them. She's going to fuss at me, but that's okay. <laughs> Wow. Oh, and mom is here. Also. Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much. Let us now be still. Let us prepare our hearts and minds for prayer. Ushers, you may seat those in the back. Let us be still before our God. As we prepare our hearts and our minds for prayer, let us remind ourselves of the power of God's peace. For many of the answers that we are seeking, the, the strength that we need, they come after the restlessness in our minds and bodies have been calmed. After our anxious thoughts have become like passing clouds. We can only see them. But they will not be felt. It comes after we realize that God is more. And therefore we are more than whatever we're struggling with. So in this moment, as we prepare our hearts and minds for prayer, be still and receive God's peace. Remembering these words of scripture, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God and the peace of God, the peace of God, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard our hearts and our minds through Christ Jesus. Let us pray. Most gracious and loving God, we come opening our hearts to you to receive your peace. 
we come to you for you are the lover of our souls. You are a healer more than you are a judge. And we thank you for loving us. We thank you for all that you provide, especially your peace. We come, oh God. We come confessing that we are often tired and in need of rest. Our souls are tired, Lord. Tired from trying to figure out what we really want. Our bodies are tired more from restlessness than from work. From endless worrying and from hiding and running away from our fears. Our minds are tired from the thoughts that weigh us down. From constantly judging ourselves and being too hard on ourselves and from constantly thinking of the ways to control what we cannot control. We're tired, Lord. We're tired of constantly worrying about our loved ones. We're tired from, from seeing our nation being destroyed and lives lost because of racism and senseless violence and this devastating pandemic. We're tired, Lord. But you have invited us to come to you when we're tired and when we need rest. And we thank you for moments like this when we can quiet our souls and find shelter in your spirit. In your presence, oh God, we can, we can let go of what has been heavy on our hearts and minds. We can stop trying to figure everything out and just trust that it will work out. It will work out for our good. Even when we may not have a clue as to how you're going to do it. Come now, oh God. Help us to take hold of the power that you have already placed within us. You have given us the spirit of power, of love, and a sound mind. Let your spirit of power, of love, and of a sound mind cause us to stop beating ourselves up and harassing ourselves because of what we have done or because of what we have not done. Give us wisdom now, Lord. Give us the strength to, to really love ourselves. To be more patient with ourselves. To trust ourselves and to believe in ourselves to believe that that you have a future and a hope for each and every one of us. We release to you now all that is heavy upon our hearts and our minds. Those things that we just don't understand, we just, we give them to you now, Lord. And we're going to trust you. We're going to trust you with the people in our lives. The people in our lives who need more than we could ever provide. We're going to trust you with all who need healing. Heal us, oh God. Heal us now. Amid this pandemic, we're, we're still going to trust you. Amid the racism, the bigotry, and the greed running rampant in our nation, we're still going to trust you. Amid our illnesses, we're going to trust you and believe that you will heal us. 
and that you will guide us through these troubling times. Hold us now, Lord. Hold us in your love until we learn how to love. Now, Dr. I still do the quietness until all our strivings cease. Take from our souls the strain and the stress and let our ordered lives confess the beauty of thy peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Assisting our speaker today is Tymeek A. Jones. Tymeek is a biology major, chemistry minor from Norway, New Jersey. My, my. Please stand here. He was lecturing Dr. Moss and I uh, this morning on entrepreneurship. Um, you're laughing, but I'm serious. <laughs> These students are amazing. It is, I don't know how to introduce um, our speaker this morning. Uh, Dr. Otis Moss III has been with us for so many years and lifting our spirits. And um, I was looking for the quote, and I think I lost it, that um, Dr. Moss, where's the, where's, where's the doctor in the house? I'm going to ask that you stand for a moment <laughs> and put you on the spot. And I want you to repeat what you said to me, what you said to Dr. Moss. Uh, I, I asked him, I, I basically said to him that he brings so much hope to everyone every time he comes to speak. Amen. Because he lets us believe that God is inside of us and we just need to bring it out. It's not outside of us. And I'm very impressed that he has had God in his life. Throughout his entire life, it wasn't just haphazard. It was Amen. A steady flow of God. Amen. Amen. And I told I was going to steal it and give her credit the first time. <laughs> so whenever you preach, whenever you come, you bring hope. 
there's no better introduction than that. But the, I think the last time you were here, um, I introduced him as being one of the greatest preachers in the nation. And I shared with you that he delivered the Lyman Beecher lectures at Yale University, which is one of the most, pre, the most prestigious lectureship in the world. And now he has added some other things to the list of accomplishments. He is an award winning film producer. He's just won three awards from the Los Angeles Movie Awards, the best documentary, short, best costume design, and best original score. Let's give God praise for the work that he's done. And many people across this nation are indebted to him for the work that he's done in voter registration. Um, I give God thanks for this remarkable preacher and remarkable human being. Following a selection from the chapel choir under the direction of Dr. Eric Poole, we will be blessed to experience the preaching and the teaching of Dr. Otis Moss III. Pray for him as he comes to bring us a word from the Lord.
the Lord at all times. God's praise shall continually be in my mouth. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt God's name together. Taste and see the goodness of the Lord, and let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Let everything that hath breath Praise. You missed your cue. Let everything that hath breath. If you have breath in your body and you are glad that God woke you up this morning and started you on your way, you have reason to give God praise. For the Lord is worthy to be praised. We give God thanks and praise for this day that the Lord has made. Praise God. I want to take uh, this moment to thank the Howard community, the Mecca, uh, for uh, allowing me to be with you on this day uh, underneath uh, the Howard Revival tent. <laughs> Amen. For, for the tent revivals that you all have been putting together in the midst of uh, this pandemic. Uh, to the dean of this chapel, uh, Dean Richardson is a national treasure. He is a blessing <clears throat> not only to this community, but all across this nation. He is a man of deep integrity and spirituality, and to have a person of his caliber on this campus is without a doubt a blessing. And we are thankful for his leadership and his work and all of the endeavors that he has been involved in. And we look forward uh, to the publication of his book of prayers that will be coming in the future that he was talking about. I tell you, can't nobody pray like Dean. I mean, he is he puts you in the face of God when he prays with such power and with such strength. And to the musical ministry, the choir, you all are outstanding. Amen. And we praise God for you <clears throat> and for all of the chapel assistants and everyone who has been participating. Even And we thank God for, for WHUT, PBS, amen, putting together all of the technical aspects uh, for this worship experience. I am just delighted and glad to be here on this day. I also want to, uh, to acknowledge I have uh, friends that are with me today. They are all the way in the back. They did not know that I could see them back there. Hugh and Marcy, we appreciate you all so very much uh, for being. We grew up together. I uh, went to high school uh, together. Uh, we will not share any stories of what we did in high school, but nonetheless, uh, he is a brother beloved and a wonderful wife and family, and we are just so grateful uh, that we have, uh, we have grown in age together and are now witnessing our children moving from uh, elementary school now into college is an extraordinary thing to witness. And I'm just so grateful uh, to see my brother and my friend with us on, on this day. If we could at this moment, uh, as we prepare to, uh, to read and enter into the word of God, if we might bow our heads just for a moment and go to God in prayer <clears throat> and offer this prayer at this time. 
Search me, O God, and know my heart. And try me and see if there is any destructive way in me. When you discover what does not belong, I ask, O God, that you would remove it from me and cast it into the sea of forgetfulness. As far as the east is from the west, that it may never return again. I thank you for the privilege to stand behind this sacred desk. I recognize that I am not worthy to preach your word. It is my request that you would send the angel by the name of grace and that angel by the name of mercy to stand on each side of this pulpit. We thank you for gathering on this sacred ground. And we ask your continued blessing upon Howard University and all of the work that goes on in this space. To be in a space of black imagination, intellectual integrity, and spiritual strength is transformative to us all. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, you are my strength, and without a doubt, you are my redeemer. Holy Spirit, do thy will, do thy will, O Holy Spirit, in the mighty, magnificent, awesome, majestic, powerful, saving, liberating, healing name of Jesus, who is the Christ, we pray. And the people of God, who love God, may say, Amen. Amen. I would like uh, for the time that we have together, if, if you have your Bible, or better yet, if you have your phone, uh, just turn with me to the fifth chapter of the Gospel according to Mark. <clears throat> Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. I'm going to read from two different translations. And then before we read, I just want to say what a blessing uh, Howard is uh, to this nation and to this world for any time there has been a moment in American history where America has moved into an area uh, where it seeks to exclude, destroy, or to walk down the road of the tragic, it's always been those who have been a part of this institu institution who have moved and rebalanced uh, this planet when it is off its axis. And I'm grateful for for this institution. Mark chapter five, if, if you found it, say amen. Uh, if you're still looking, say hold up. If you don't have a Bible, just say praise God. All right, all right. Uh, Mark chapter five, I'm gonna read from two different translations. One is the New International Version and the other is the OM3 translation. That's the Otis Moss III translation. That'll be out next year, edited by Dean Richardson, amen. <laughs> And it reads this way, Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. Another translation, and a sister was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. Another translation, she suffered a great deal under the medical system, for she did not have the necessary medical insurance. And instead of growing better, she grew worse. When she heard, when she heard, heard about Jesus, when she heard, when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I can touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? The disciples then said, oh, Jesus, can't you see there's a crowd that is pressing against you? And here you are saying, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then this sister, 
knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. Another translation, then this sister came and told the whole story and told everything that happened to her. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. And a sister was there who had been the subject of bleeding for 12 years, who had been suffering a great deal under many doctors and had spent everything she had instead of getting better she grew worse when she heard Jesus was in town. When she heard and Jesus said, daughter, your faith has healed you. Now go in peace and be freed from your suffering. I'd like to place a tag here on, on this text for it constitutes the context of which we attempt to, to teach and to preach at this moment. I'd like for us to focus on this idea of we have nothing to lose. We have nothing to lose. If you could do me a favor and just look at your neighbor who has a mask on, just look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, oh, neighbor, we have nothing to lose. Amen. We have nothing to lose. Uh, beloved, it was years ago growing up in Cleveland, Ohio, there was something that I loved to do, Hugh, especially uh, when I was with my godfather and my godbrother. Every year in Cleveland, the circus would come. And I have to be honest that I, I love the circus. And I'm talking about the three ring Barnum and Bailey circus. I, I loved everything about the circus. I loved it when those, uh, that little tiny car would come by. And then all of a sudden, out of a tiny car, 11 clowns would pop out of a little car. I love the trapeze artists, all of the pageantry about the circus, but I especially enjoyed the animals. I love the lions, the tigers, the bears. Oh, my. I loved everything. But there was one particular animal, Dean Richardson, that absolutely fascinated me. Every time this animal came out into the circus ring, and it was uh, the elephant, especially the elephants collectively. There was something amazing about them looking at this uh, majestic and powerful animal that every year I would go to the circus taken by my godfather by the name of Alfred Warren, who we called Torpedo because he was an all-American diver at Central State University. And, and I was amazed by these elephants, but, but I was also bothered simultaneously. He said, it never made any sense to me that an animal that has such power such majesty and strength, would listen to a little man with a whip and a chair. Well, why would an animal that has more power, more strength, and more authority than the person standing in front of it, why would he listen to a person with a whip and a chair? And the other piece that always made me nervous even though these animals were listening to this person with a whip and a chair was, I was always nervous that there was going to be an elephant coup d'etat to take place. We usually had good seats, usually the third row, and I thought the revolution was going to happen in the third row when they walked by. But it was my godfather who told me, Hugh, that, that you need not worry that anything is going to happen because you need to know how uh, the elephants got into the position that they are in. The reason that the elephants will not start a revolution, nor will there be a coup d'etat, is because the elephants uh, will listen to the man with the whip and the chair who does not have more authority or power because the elephant has been raised and miseducated from a small child to believe that the person who does not have as much power in front of him actually has more authority than him. He explained to me that when elephants are small, they place chains around the elephant's neck. 
And then they give the elephant a leash about 12 feet in length. And the elephant develops believing that it is the natural order of things that he is to have a chain around his neck and a leash that is roughly 12 feet long. That leash is a limitation on its possibility. And as a child, the elephant thinks that I can only move roughly 12 feet away. And when he sees the person with the whip and the chair, he gives that person more authority than they should actually have. But eventually, the elephant is emancipated from the chains. But because the mind has been functioning a certain way, even though you take the chains away, the elephant still functions as if the elephant is all in chains at the same time. So even though there are no chains, the elephant still functions as if the elephant is chained. But here is what my Godfather told me that blessed me so. He told me that now the only thing that you need to worry about is you don't need to worry about the elephant that has been miseducated all of his life. You need to worry about an animal that realizes I ain't got nothing to lose. Because the moment I know that your whip can't stop me, your chair can't hurt me, and I don't have any chains around my neck, there's an elephant coup d'etat that's about to happen right now. You all are still missing what I'm saying. Don't you know there are people in America that have been trying to put us in our particular place they believe that we should be, but the reality is we've been emancipated from our chains and there needs to be a revolution to take place to transform this place we call America. The day you understand that that man with a whip and a chair can't stop you is the day a revolution will happen in these yet to be United States of America. Somebody doesn't hear me. You see, you must have a whole lot of power if I've got to write new laws to keep you from voting because I'm afraid of you. But the moment we organize, we ain't got nothing to lose because we have more power together. And those who want to keep us in our posi particular positions recognize that, that we have nothing to lose. Ah, we must be awfully powerful that you've got to go through all the southern states and change some voting laws in order to keep us from voting. But I'm here to let you know we have nothing to lose. In the words of James Baldwin, you see, the words you choose to call me and the prison you try to put me in says more about you than it does about me. Ah, you must be some kind of powerful that people spend so much energy trying to limit, control, and constrict and cancel who you are. Politicians will fancy uh, fashion policies. Economists will produce theories. Theologians will design doctrines. Scientists will create categories. And man will manufacture labels uh, in order to keep individuals in a particular box. You need to understand this, that the wall between your calling and your constriction is mighty thin. In the moment, in the words of Paul Tillich and Dr. Kanika, that you have the courage to be, to lean into the truth of your sacred nature, is the moment you shall become a central character in your own liberation story. We have nothing to lose. And this is a revolutionary moment in these United States. This is a revolutionary moment in uh, your own particular spirit that you need to know that you cannot operate under the boxes that somebody else created for you. You've got to learn how to step out of the box and be the person that God has called you to be. And you have nothing to lose. So and so, Dean, I, I have to excavate and look at this scripture before we move forward. I have to break some things down so that you can understand what is being stated here in the gospel according to Mark. You see, I am enlightened by a great biblical scholar by the name of Dr. Wilda Gaffney. She teaches Hebrew Bible at the Bright Divinity School in Texas and wrote an incredible book entitled The Womanist Midrash. She gives a beautiful retelling of Old Testament texts, and she writes about people in the Old Testament that are placed in restriction. 
people that are to live in restricted communities because most of the men didn't understand what was going on. If you had a form of leprosy, you had to be restricted. If you had a lesion on your hand, you had to be restricted. But especially, as Dr. Gaffney says, this idea of restriction fell upon the spirit mostly of women. That a woman who was going through her normal cycle, it was men who said that you have to be restricted. But it is Dr. Gaffney who says that in English we use the wrong word. In the English, we use the word that the person is unclean, which is a problem problem theologically, because as soon as you say someone is unclean, you then make a moral claim about that individual as if God made something that is unclean in itself. It makes no sense whatsoever. And so it is Dr. Gaffney who says you need to use the word restriction. That there are some people who are restricted and it was believed uh, that there are those, if they have a lesion, if, if there's something that we don't understand, if they are bleeding over and over, we must restrict them. And they must live in a restricted community with other restricted people. And in that restriction, there won't be the same investment that you have in other communities because you live in a restricted community, in a restricted village, in a restricted space. So we now have the right to create a policy. We want your labor, but we don't want your voice because you live in restriction. So she was stating that you have to place people in restriction and because there was some confusion about the idea of bleeding. But one must know that within the ancient Israelite tradition, they knew that blood has power. Just as black people know blood has power, that there is life and there is death in blood. The blood can save it. If you lose too much blood, you can die. But you see, they knew that blood had power because the Israelites knew that if you want the death angel to pass over your household, you got to put some blood on the doorpost. They knew that the blood never loses its power, that there is power in the blood. And even black folk who grew up in the 70s know there's power in the blood because when they roll up on somebody and say, what's up, blood? If you're from the 70s, because we know there's power and there's a mystery in reference to the blood. Because there is power in the blood. And this woman was forced to live in restriction because she was bleeding. And what she was releasing from her body was a symbol of power. She was restricted because other people could see that there was power flowing from her. And then it is, it is Jesus, who <laughs> Jesus who arrives in this text. And I have to say, I'm a Jesus man. I, I love me some Jesus. Jesus is my man. And if you read in Mark 5, when you go home, beginning in verse 1, you will see that Jesus comes across a lake in order to spend some time with a man who's living in the tombs, who has a variety of demons. And what I love about the text, I can't preach it right now, but you will find a man who has a legion of demons upon him. And what is so especially amazing is what happens in the text that blows my mind is that you will notice that when Jesus shows up that there is this man who has a legion of demons. He has chains around his wrists, chains around his ankles, and he falls at the feet of Jesus. He's been cutting himself day and night, but no one wants to give him some assistance. They allow him to live in the tombs. And it's Jesus who answers one simple question, asks one question and says, what is your name? And the man says, our name is Legion, for we are many. In other words, his issues answer. Instead of him answering and Jesus releases this man at this day and he then continues on his walk and now he is moving into a community and as he moves into this community a rabbi shows up and says I need you to come and see about my little girl a, a middle class rabbi 
shows up. And that is what is happening at the beginning of the text. Jesus is walking with this man who is asking Jesus to come and see about his little girl. But then all of a sudden, everything changes in the text because when Jesus shows up, captives are set free. When Jesus shows up, withered hands are restored. When Jesus shows up, the lame can walk and the blind can see. But here is a thing that I want you to understand that people miss when reading this text. They think that Jesus is the central character. But the central character is a sister whose name we don't even know. And I love this sister. She's a bad sister because we know her issues but we don't know anything about her. We know her condition, but we don't know anything about her character. And I'm here to let you know, don't ever confuse your condition with your character. My condition is external, but my character is internal. Homelessness is a condition. Mass incarceration is a condition. Poverty is a condition. Underfunded schools, that's a condition, but it says nothing about my character. And truth be told, some of the brightest minds are not at a Howard, are not at Emory, are not at Morehouse. No, many of them are on the street hustling. They are better mathematicians than anybody in the mathematics department, for they can compute some things in their mind we cannot even conceive of. Don't confuse condition with character. Mm. And this and this woman, she has a particular condition but it has nothing to do with her character. But I must say this to you, that you must have the audacity to investigate your spiritual character. Because the question is, there are people who create boxes for us, but as my father would say, did you accept the box? Did you step into the box? Did you disenfranchise yourself? Because there has to be a partnership between the oppressed and the oppressor if you're going to stay in the position you are. But the moment you say, I ain't got nothing to lose, you can move out of your condition because your character is saying, I don't belong here because I'm a child of the Most High God. Mm. Even though she was placed in restriction. Even though she was dealing with this self in disenfranchisement. But I must tell you this. You see, it is your choice whether you want to remain in exile and restriction. It is your choice whether you will stay in the boxes that other people made for you. It is your choice if you will listen to your haters or you will decide to step out and listen to the spirit of God whispering in your soul. It's your choice. And nothing is more painful than to hold the ashes of regret in one hand and missed opportunity in the other because you listened to somebody who did not want to see you thrive. Ah, and this woman, and what I love about this woman is that she is so powerful, Hugh. She does something so revolutionary and so extraordinary. She decides, I don't have anything to lose. I'm leaving my restriction because I heard Jesus is in town. So y'all missed your shout. She, she's living with hundreds of other people who are in the same condition. She's living with other people who used to have those chains around their neck. And everybody else is staying in that position. But she heard that Jesus was in town. She's now, she hadn't met Jesus. She just heard about Jesus. In other words, she heard what he could do. And she said, I'm leaving this place of restriction and I'm stepping out to find this man named Jesus. And if you all know how some people operate, somebody will tell you, you know, you're not going to be healed. You know, they're going to send you back here and you're going to be in the same position you were. You might as well stay here. At least you got a nice little secure job over here in restriction than trying to go over there to Howard and spend all that money. What if it don't work out right? Just stay right here with everybody else in your family. And she says, 
I'm going to step out because I heard about Jesus. Because you see, Jesus can heal me. And if he heals me, I'll shout. But if he doesn't heal me, at least I will have new scenery. You see, sometimes you got to leave where you are just so that you have a different vision of what God can do in your life. You've got to leave the spaces where you've been restricted so you can see something new. If I stayed here all my life, then I would have a low looking way of seeing the world. But you see, if I stay on the block, I'll only have a block mentality. But if I move out the block, I can see the world and see new possibility. I would rather fail on my own terms than fail with you telling me what I can't do. Is there anybody here? Do you know that you've got to step out? Even if you fail, at least you got some new scenery. And so this sister is so bad, Dean. She says, I'm leaving because I heard Jesus is in town. I'm leaving the restriction. And you will notice nobody goes with her. You have to have some kind of character to be able to push aside all of the people telling you it ain't going to work. No one walks with her. And that's why I love her so much. And she says to her best friend forever, says, I'm sorry. I know we're friends, but you like living in restriction. I'm not satisfied with this life. I believe God called me to something else. So I'm leaving where you're trying to keep me. And there are some people you got to leave behind if you're going to reach the goal that God has placed in your spirit. You ain't got to talk about him bad. You just got to say, see you later. I'll send you a postcard so you can see where I've been. I'll send you a note and take a few pictures so you'll know that I have left restriction. So she leaves the restriction, a place where everybody who is bleeding, who has a lesion, this, this, this community that the world has created to say that you are to have a lid upon your like, limitations, upon uh, your dreams, she leaves. And what is I love about her is she says, I ain't got nothing to lose. I've been living over here with y'all. At least I can try something new. And so she leaves out. But but here is the thing that makes oh makes me shout. When I saw this the first time, Dean, literally I was in my study. I was shouting. She then leaves. She has to walk out of the restriction. She's leaving the restriction now. And she then has to get to Jesus. But you got to understand that Jesus is rolling with his disciples. His disciples are trying to protect him from the press of the crowd. So they're functioning like these armor bearers. What they're doing is they're trying to protect people, protect Jesus from the crowd. And so the people who've been with Jesus the longest are keeping people from getting to Jesus. The people who've been rolling with Jesus all their life are the main ones blocking other people's blessings because they believe Jesus needs protection. But I'm here to let you know he's Jesus. He don't need our protection. Jesus don't need you to protect him because he's the word that became flesh. Jesus needs no protection by your doctrine, by your theology. Jesus can handle any question, any issue you may have. He don't need nobody's protection. And the sister says, I've got to get to Jesus. So she tries to roll up on Jesus. But there's all these brothers. (laughs) There's all these brothers. Oh, let me stop. There's all these brothers. Ain't no sisters. It's just brothers trying to keep the sister from Jesus. You missed it. There's brothers saying to the sister, you you missed it. There's a brother trying to tell the sister, you can't, you missed it. A brother trying to tell the sister, you can't, you missed it again. A brother trying to say, you can't get to Jesus. Uh, There there are those uh, uh, who say uh, that a sister should not preach. 
because they're like these disciples trying uh, to protect people uh, from Jesus. So I have a theological question that I must say to every brother. Why is it that God would trust a woman with the word before he trusts a brother with the word? He trusts a sister for nine months to carry the word before any man can preach the word. Then obviously if a sister can carry it, then a sister can preach it. So you got some brothers trying to keep this woman from getting to Jesus. But see, she's a sister. The sister knows she going to get what she going to get. And she knows. And watch what happens. Now, normally, we would try and reach Jesus and say, hey, Jesus, right here. I need to heal it. She don't even do that. She doesn't even call his name. It says in scripture that she touches the hem of his garment. Now, now for those of you who, who don't know anything about garments, the hem ain't up here. The hem is down here, which means everyone was expecting her to go here. But she then falls down here and is able to reach Jesus. In other words, I'm going to put myself in a position of worship in order to get to Jesus so that those who are trying to block me can't see me and don't even know what I'm doing is subversive to transform things that are happening right now. Woo! You got to see this, but it gets, it gets gooder, y'all. She touches the hymn. You still missed, you missed your shout. She touched, hold on, it, get the hem, touch the hem. Do you see that? T touch the hem. Y'all got it? T touch the, touch the hem. She never touched Jesus. She just touched what Jesus touched. In other words, she came in contact with what had been in contact with Jesus. And that was enough to heal her. You still missed it. You see, some of us have been blessed, not because you came in contact with Jesus, but you had a grandma that had contact with Jesus. And because she had contact, it ended up blessing your life. Sometimes you got to be in contact with somebody who's been in contact with God. And at that moment, mm, uh, she touches the hem of his garment, and immediately she's healed. Y'all missed it. Immediately she's healed because hmm, a little bit of the spiritual DNA of Jesus was all in the garment, and she's now healed. But Jesus said, let me stop. I felt power go out. You missed it. Now, normally we think of Jesus when Jesus heals, he says, you're healed. But this sister must have gone to Howard and decided that I'm going to get my healing. I'm going to roll up and say, Jesus, I need this. And don't, don't look at me funny because there's some people in your life who had prayers that were so powerful that they petitioned God and God's power flowed in such a way. That literally she says, I need you to show up in such a way that even if I don't touch you, the hem of your garment literally will send power my way. Mm. And so now she's healed. And Jesus says, who touched me? And of course, the brothers don't know because the brothers are so busy trying to block people from their blessing that they're missing out on the miracle right in front of them. How can you say somebody... Ah, uh, somebody touched you and there are all these people who are pressing against you right now. Who touched me? And eventually the woman comes and falls on her knees and says it was me. And she has tears in her eyes. And she says, you know, I've been bleeding for 12 years. I've been part of a medical apartheid system. A system that didn't heal me, that wanted my money, but did not want to see me healed. But I heard that you were in town. I heard what you did to a demon-possessed man. 
I heard what you did for a man who couldn't walk. I heard what you did for a woman who has been over for so many years. I heard what you did with a little boy's lungs. And because of what I heard, I stepped out of my restriction. I stepped out of that community and I said I'm going to find you and even if you don't see me I see you and I will touch the hem of your garment and power came out from the hem of the garment and all of a sudden I was healed and now I feel different because I've had an encounter with you but here is the thing Dean that makes me shout that made me run around my study Jesus says daughter mm, your faith has healed you. You still missed it. Jesus says, daughter, your faith has healed you. You still missed your shout. Daughter, your faith has healed you. You're still missing your shout here. When we started out in the text, we only knew her condition. But by the time we get down here, she's got a new name. Her name is Daughter. In other words, you're in my family. And if anybody knows anything about how the Israelite family operates, you see, if you are called Daughter, it means you're in the family. And because you're in the family, it means if you mess with the, my daughter, you mess with me so don't you mess with my daughter but still you're missing your shout because there's never been a disciple that's been called a son because a daughter is higher than a disciple in other words he's higher than Peter she's higher than John she's higher than James she's higher than Mark she's higher than Luke she's higher than Paul because she stepped out of restriction and Jesus says you are a daughter that you see there will be miracles that manifest when you step out of your restriction daughter there will be power in your life son when you step out of places that other people made for you is there anybody here are you ready to step out daughter are you ready to step out son there's nothing to lose don't you let people box you in and tell you who you are you you are a child of the most high God is there anybody in here do you know you're a child of God then open up your mouth and say I'm a child of God I have nothing nothing to lose you have nothing to lose and I can imagine in my sanctified imagination she's walking in the community Walking past the people who put her in restriction. Somebody saying, you don't belong here. And she says, you don't know who I am. I'm a daughter of the most high God. You don't have the right to put me in a corner. You don't have the right to exclude me. You don't have the right to place me in a particular box. I will not let patriarchy put me here. Racism put me here. Homophobia put me here. I will not allow you. I am a daughter, a son, a child of the Most High God. Is there anybody in here? Do you know you are a child of God? You are a child of the most high God. Step out of your restriction and stop letting little people with chairs and whips tell you what you can do. The chains are gone. Release them from your mind and release them from your spirit and watch what God will do. I was taught that when God speaks so mightily, 
the person following you should just say amen and sit down. But I often ask students when they hear a message like this to ask yourself, why me? Why did I hear this and why was I privileged to be in this place? I see my friend Mary Wright Elderman in the back and she talks about the experience of hearing Mordecai Wyatt Johnson and Ben Green Mays and Howard Thurman speak. Dr. Morris didn't know it, but the person who he was quoting, the scholar, was one of ours, Wilda Gaffney. And she would sit right here in this chapel, listening to preachers like you, probably heard you. And then she left and produced what you just talked about. And so when I say, ask yourself, why you? Why me? It's for a reason. Because I believe that what the preacher preaches is so important for you to hear because you are that person, you will be that person that others will teach from and learn from and produce. You are indeed blessed to hear a message as we heard this morning. Thank you, Dr. Moss. Let us pray. We thank you, O God, for what eyes have seen. We thank you for what our ears have heard. We thank you, O God, for this, this, this message, reminding us that we do not have nothing to lose. And if we just trust you, you will take care of us. Thank you, O God. And now I said to the one who stood at the gate, give me a light that I may go out into the darkness and into the unknown. And she replied to me, go out into the darkness. Go out into the unknown. But put your hand in the hand of God. And God shall be for you better than light and much safer than a known way. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace, both now and forevermore. Amen. Please be seated. Please uh, stay where you are until the speaker exits from the back. Thank you. Join us for food and fellowship following the service.